Hey, this is Haley. This is Heather. And you're watching the Who Done It Sisters, a Kansas City true crime podcast. This episode is on David Iman. You'll also get to see an interview that we did with David Iman's sister, Susan. So stay tuned. Well, um, his name is David, and he was 15. It, well, um, our family, my parents kind of had two families. They had three kids, and then they got divorced. And then 10 years later, they got remarried and had David and I. So it was kind of different. David was a much better person than I. I was the spoiled one, and he was the one that was content with whatever was left over. Mm-hmm. And, you know, never really complained. We didn't argue or fight. There was only a couple of times that he even said anything that was offensive to me when he was going through his teenage angst, you know. But... um we kind of shared the same friends a lot of the time. Our house was the hangout house after school. So there were always a lot of people around. David had a lot of friends. I mean, he had a handful of really super close friends, but there was never anybody that didn't like him. Teachers liked him. Other kids liked him. He loved family. He loved family get togethers. We used to have family reunions back in the day. And we had two a year and he just loved it. I was the one that didn't want to go and thought it was so lame. Even as a teenager, he liked getting together with all the family, even though we hardly knew most of them, you know. He was a gentle type person. He wasn't very crazy. I mean, a few of them were, but he he wasn't really one of the crazy ones, at least not that I knew of. But, you know... It's different because I was his sister, not one of his friends. <laughs> so I'm sure there were sides of him that his friends knew better than I knew. Within the family, he was very, he was a calming kind of presence in the household. It was me and him and my mom when he passed away. And he was, I mean, he was really close to our dad. And our dad died when he was 12. Mm-hmm. When David was twelve, and I know that that changed him a lot, which of course twelve, you're kind of at that age anywhere where you're going to change. But he immediately, you know, he dropped out of Boy Scouts. He no longer had an interest in school. I mean, he was heartbroken when our dad died. David seemed a little on the quiet side, but his friends, I mean, he just nobody ever didn't like him. He didn't have an enemy. And that started when we were little bitty. He talked to people all the time, whether he knew them or not. He was the outgoing, uh, fun, uh, made people laugh as a child. And then as he got into his teenagers, once our dad died, he did change, became a more serious person, a little quieter. And plus he was growing and changing anyway, you know. He had a serious girlfriend that he had had, um, I don't remember for how long, about a year. I mean, he wasn't very old when you think about it now as a parent, I think. Well, he was only 15, so, but they, he really loved his girlfriend Mm. and he spent a lot of time with her. She spent a lot of time at our house too. And even her family, her family loved him. Her mom loved him. He was really looking forward to getting his driver's license because that was the next big thing for him. His last summer, we spent in San Diego. My mom, our mom flew us out there 
and we spent the summer out there with our older, older brother who lived in Ocean Beach. He lived right on the beach. So we had an awesome summer. And I've been so thankful for that summer because it was just him and I. And, you know, in those times, you communicated with other people. There weren't all these devices. And, and he really, really loved our older brother. You know, they were the only two boys in the family, even though there were a lot of space in between them. He loved visiting him. So that last summer we went together and then we were home a week when he was killed. Um, I know that he was a little, once we got back from California, he was a little more withdrawn and quieter than usual. I didn't know why then, although I, I thought he had a lot on his mind because he'd been held back a year in the eighth grade. So all of his friends were going over to the high school, but he wouldn't be. Mm. He'd be mm. stuck at the same junior high. We even had classes together. So all of his friends were kind of leaving. They're still going to be together, but without him. And I thought maybe that's why he was a little quieter. He just had all this on his mind. He was very open person. He never even shut his bedroom door unless he was getting dressed. Otherwise, his door was open. I was always welcome to go in there. And um, he came in my room all the time, too. And I think um, that was the first time he would shut his door when he wasn't getting dressed. He just shut his door. And I remember feeling like he was shutting me out. I felt left out and offended by that. But now... You know, I don't know what was going through his mind or what he was going through. Obviously, there was something going on that I that none of us knew about, or might might have been something going on that none of us knew about because because of the manner in which he died. So I don't know what in in his personal experiences what what led up to that. And that's the question that has always been unanswered, you know, like, why? Can you yeah. tell us what happened? Well, he, um, he called my mom at 11, what was it? 1115 and asked for a ride home. Well, she didn't want to go get him and she was upset with him because he was out this late. And I remember hearing that conversation so he apparently, so he, he called for a ride and then he left his girlfriend's house at what time was it? 1230, but he left her house. She said she watched him walk because she had a corner house. She watched him walk around the house and down the sidewalk. And then she went back in the house and that's the last anybody saw of him. 15 year old David Iman left his girlfriend's home around 1245 AM on August 14th of 74 in the area of 118th and Blue Ridge. Before doing so, he called his mom, told his girlfriend to see it tomorrow, and he never made it home. When he called my mom for a ride, I, I wondered personally if he felt like somebody was waiting for him, somebody was after him and he was scared because he had never called for a ride. That was the first time I ever heard him ask for a ride from our mom. Wow. Because we just walked and hitchhiked, and he walked it all the time to her house and back at all hours of the night. So for him to ask for a ride was completely out of character. Her parents were home. Her, well, her mom was home, but she didn't have the car. Her dad had the car. So she couldn't take him home either. And, yeah, I think it was 1215 now that I remember when he left her house. So he waited, you know, a good hour um, before actually leaving her house. And he I just, stalled. yeah, he did. And I think in my own mind, maybe he felt like somebody was watching him. Maybe they were. Maybe that police officer was down the street watching him, watching for him to come out of the house. How he would know he's there, I don't know, though. You know, all I have is a bunch of theories.
he was found here at 3 a.m. by Raymore officer Harry Funston, a quarter of a mile from 155th and Peterson. He was doused in gasoline. His arms and his legs were bound by rope, and he was set on fire. He was charred and unrecognizable. His autopsy report shows that he was burned alive. The officer, Harry Funston, was and still is the number one suspect in this case. He was unaccounted for for three hours. He had carbon monoxide poisoning in his lungs. Oh, so I think he was in the trunk then? I think so. I mean, they can't tell me. All I have now are my own conclusions. I think that he was in the trunk. Sounds like it. Yeah. And it was a car from 1974. But I know that that police officer was somewhat of a pedophile, which the cold case detective told me about that, that he did have a thing for teenage boys. And so I wondered if he had propositioned David or something and something went wrong or he had propositioned him at another time. And he had refused him. I mean, all there's a million things in my head, possible causes, possible reasons, you know. I, but that suspect being what he was like kind of makes me think that he had dealt with him before. And where he was picked up was in our neighborhood. Um, and you lived in the, uh, the Ruskin area? Yeah. 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 And this police officer was... Um, Raymore. Right. Supposed to be in Raymore, not in Ruskin. And so there had to be something going on that caused him to be in that area. Close to where his body was found was a party spot at the time where kids often moved. Because it was secluded. There was a lot of woods around. But it was easy to get to. You know, it's that that road is a main road pretty much now. And I know that he had been, the police officer had been to that party spot before, not as a cop, but just as a person, because I had a couple people tell me that they, they would see him there. So I don't know if he had had interactions with David, but apparently it didn't go his way, whatever it was. Um, I don't know what their interactions would be other than, you know, David was a good looking kid. Yeah, he was. He was tall. He was fit and he had long, gorgeous hair. He did. (laughs) You know, a really nice face too. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's no mystery that he could have picked him out, singled him out as an interest. Um. And maybe he did approach him and, you know, I've even thought at times maybe David told him that he was going to tell people all about him. I don't know. Um, They wouldn't have been able to tell in the autopsy if there was um, defensive wounds, right? Because he would have been burned. So that wouldn't have been able, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. There was no blunt trauma to his right. head. Um, his body, as far as they could tell, nothing was, there was no internal damage. Mm. He was shot or stabbed or any of that. Um, I think that he was in the trunk of a car for that three hours and he got carbon monoxide poisoning. He was probably unconscious by then. I think that when he opened the trunk to take him out, he saw him unconscious and he freaked out. And he did what he always did in situations. He lit a fire. You know, I I think maybe he thought that he had already died. And so he was, you know, he knew how to destroy evidence. That's for sure. That's just my own theory, though. He was a cop that was married with a daughter. If David did threaten to tell people, that could have easily set him off or scared him, thought he has to scare this kid. Maybe so he wouldn't tell people. I I don't know. 
I've got a million theories in my head. And then um, the autopsy, did it show anything? Mm. Was it able to show if there was any assault, sexual assault? They couldn't find any. Okay. No. Okay. And his clothing was intact. His boots were off. Right. Sitting beside him. I mean, honestly, I don't know how thorough they were now that I, you know, know more about the department. Of course, it was a different department then. No, but they didn't find any signs of sexual assault um, or even physical assault where he hadn't been hit. Um, he didn't have head trauma. Nothing like that. I think that he was very power, power hungry cop and and i spoke to a couple of different people that were kids in belton at the time that also had had run-ins with him there's several of them actually on what a bully he was and one of the things one gal told me really stood out because she said her and her boyfriend went to the truck stop i mean not trucks the um, car wash late at night one night and one of their friends was tied to a light pole and he was awake and said that this cop had tied him to the light pole because he said that he was driving drunk and he got mouthy, tied him to the light pole to teach him a lesson, just took off and left him there tied to this light pole. And he tied these knots that nobody could get undone. So they had to get help to get this kid down. And so. Like him as, as a suspect makes perfect sense to me. Once I studied him and his life, it makes perfect sense to me. So I feel, you know, something happened in my mind at the time when David was killed. And my mother, you know, it was so painful for her. And as a mother, I, I don't know that particular pain and I can't imagine it. But she took down every picture that had David in it. We had no evidence that he had ever even lived there. And I regret that she did that now because I don't think she ever grieved his death. And I certainly didn't. I went on to just forget all about him totally. And I grew up and had children and never even told my children I had a brother. Mm. That's how far removed it was from me until four years ago. And. I had a strange experience that I can't explain, but, um, yeah, I just, I, I thought of him. It was almost like I remembered him all of a sudden and didn't know where my life had gone, but I remembered him. And then I started with the phone calls and all, all of that. And I feel like if it, if it hadn't been for me, like, I don't know if my mother put all of his stuff away because of me or because of her, you know, it, it was a very painful thing. Um, some of our friends moved away right after that. I mean, the whole community seemed to be shook by, by that and partly the way in which he died. So I think that he picked him up because he knew who he was. And I think that he put him in the trunk Maybe he wanted to scare him. Something was happening. And I think, to be perfectly honest, that when he stopped the car to take him out, I think he thought that he was dead. And I think that because this police officer also was a fire bug. So he had, you know, that reputation of starting fires then calling him in, then putting them out. Mm -hmm. So he always looked like he was, you know, the efficient one and always. Yeah, the hero. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> right. That's just my own hypothesis is that yeah. he thought that he was dead if he had carbon monoxide poisoning. Right. But he was breathing. Um, they did tell me that because of the, the manner in which his lungs were. If he had not been breathing, the, the carbon monoxide would have been more in his throat, but it was deep in his lungs, like he was breathing it in, actually. The, I think that he would have had to be unconscious for right. him 
to do all that. Right. You know? One person by himself. And they said they never even suspected that anybody was with him. They think that it was just him by himself. The police, their main suspect, and what they told me, the cold case detectives told me four years ago when I first started uh, wanting his case reopened and stuff like that, he told me that they knew who did it, but they could never convict him because they didn't have enough evidence. But I've, I've had issues with the detectives because I don't feel like they've been honest with me. You know, after I first started talking to them, then come to find out they had lost some of the evidence that they collected from the crime scene. And then when I talked to them the next time, they were going to get out what evidence they did have left. And then they said they didn't have any evidence left. They couldn't find any of it. They even had the rope that was used to tie him up with. They had his belt. They had his boots. They had vacuumings from the car, of uh, the suspect's car and trunk. They had, and, and apparently they don't have any of it now. And I, I feel like I've been lied to, to be honest. And right after he was killed, their main suspect left the state and they didn't make him stay here. They, he would have been so easy to follow. I don't even think they tried to follow him, even though they say they knew he did it. So we've had issues and my mother did too. She had issues at the time dealing with the police and would often be yelling on the phone and crying. And, you know, she wasn't being heard. She didn't feel like they were considering a priority. I mean, they said that they gave it longer than they normally give cases. They spent nine days. And I'm thinking, what is nine days? And how is that longer? I mean, it's just kind of like those first few days, they were hot and heavy on trying to find out, even though they already had the suspect and they already knew in their mind who was responsible. He left the state shortly after that in a hurry actually, because his house was found like abandoned, like he had just picked up in the middle of the night and took off, didn't even pack up his house. Why they didn't follow him, I would like to know that now. And they can't seem to tell me anything anymore. So I've been really disappointed with the cold case, Kansas City cold case detective unit. And they, they opened this cold case, cold case unit but it's not served us well at all. They're never cooperative. They never really even want to talk to me. And so I quit calling them mainly because I felt that I was at a dead end and nothing more could be done. I knew where the suspect lived because I had found him. I told the cold case detective that and he told me, no, the suspect died years ago. Well, I knew that wasn't true. He wasn't because I had found him. Then a different detective said, no, he's not dead. Um, I found him too. You know, that that's our cold case department. I feel like at the time they bumbled, bung, whatever, everything. They just dropped the ball like repeatedly and repeatedly. They let him run away is what they did. They did not have the suspect's DNA in their system because they said he'd never been charged with a felony. Then I found out that in, in the eighties, he was charged with a felony in 87. He robbed a um, casino bank, um, him and his brother. They didn't even want to talk to me about that at all. I actually have my older brother, the one that we were visiting that summer, his ex-wife is a judge there in San Diego. And she had someone in Las Vegas where the policeman lived just a few years ago. She had someone there that would collect his DNA. And Kansas City said they wouldn't accept it. If you do collect it, we can't accept it because he's not a felon. And I, 
tried to tell me he hadn't been arrested when he had. And I did get the file. I got his entire police file. They allowed me to get copies of that. Um, and I did learn from reading that, that in, what year was it? 1980, um, I believe. He was sharing an apartment and, he, and, and his roommate went to the local police because he had confessed, told him what he had done. Um, they said they no longer honor confessions because anybody can confess to a crime and it may be covering up for someone, blah, 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 blah. They paid no attention to that confession at all that I could find anywhere in his file. They didn't even follow up with him. They didn't even know where he lived, oh but yet everybody else does. I mean, it's now you can find almost anybody because I just used Facebook and found him. And then the suspect died two years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think at that point, I kind of gave up because I didn't know what else to do. So I, I wanted them to be able to say who did it and close the case. But they don't seem to want to do that. Um, I thought his ex-wife would be helpful. Um, and all she could say um, was that, yes, he did like fire. So she says this about her ex-husband. That's all she can tell us is, yes, he did like fire. What an odd thing to say, you know, talking about that he might have taken somebody's life. I'm just kind of at a dead end, to be honest. I don't know where to go from here. I don't, I mean, I'm writing everything down trying to put all the notes in some kind of order. Okay. That's what I'm doing for my own personal therapy. Just, you know, but I don't know what to do. <laughs> David hasn't gotten what, what he deserves, you know. Thank you so much. Well, I, I appreciate you so much. I no. can't tell you how good it feels to have somebody take an interest in him. Oh, absolutely. Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, but David deserves all the publicity that he can get. I'm just so thankful for you both. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I know David is too. So according to David's sister, David was acting out of character that week before he was murdered. And you texted Susan after the interview to ask. Mm -hmm. Because I was trying to figure out. Right. Because it's, they went on, they went to San Diego for the summer. Mm -hmm. There's a week there leading up to his death. And I was like, what might have changed him within that week? And um, I asked her if, if he went to any parties because I remember her mentioning that. They were field parties where the officer has attended. So I thought, well, maybe they met at a, at a party at some point. And she said, yeah, the Thursday before he attended a party. But didn't, it was really foggy, any, like, details about that party. Because right. I asked her, was it one of the field parties? And she said it was real foggy. She didn't remember. But I think, was it me and you talking? Because I know we always hypothesize after conversations right. or interviews. Um, do you think something might have happened even before the vacation or do you think it all happened like in, oh he felt right. free there didn't have anything to worry about maybe it could have happened before i probably should have asked her when did she know was it just that week that it he was started? the week it okay was then the one it had to have been something, something then. traumatizing because you also wanted to you also wanted me to bring up the fact that um he's never asked for a ride home before He's never asked for a ride home. I didn't, I was, I, when she said that, I was like floored. Because she said that they, they walked, they hitchhiked. It was a normal. Right. It was so completely for him to ask for a ride home, he was concerned about something. And then he waited approximately like an hour before he even started walking home. He was stalling. In my opinion, he was stalling. 
um, acting the out of character, shutting the door to me. I know that if he had been raped or sexually abused, um, males can be very well we standoffish all, and very yeah. Um, all of a sudden, you just yeah, you're within yourself very much, and I wonder um, what the girlfriend how his behavior was with her. Just talking about Funston for a minute. The Jackson County Fire Marshal was investigating Funston for all of the fires that he had been that he had found first. It was just too too much that he was there too on many. the scene too quickly. Too many times had he to be the hero. I think exactly. So we have that, mm -hmm. and then we have the fact that during his interrogation after David's death, he um, was acting out of character. He was always considered an angry, loud man, and during the interrogation, he was meek. He cried. He they thought he was close to. Um, actually confessing two times but he was and he was overly concerned about how this would affect his dad like this would kill my dad if he thought that I had killed somebody not at all acting like somebody who had been just um you know you I think you killed somebody no no way I mean he flunked the polygraph two times they found the same type of rope that was around David in his trunk mm -hmm. Um, there, there were male juveniles who have come forward saying that he has made sexual passes at, on, at them in the car, that he would drive them around doing those rides that you do with police officers. Ride-alongs. Ride-alongs, except, of course, like under the table ride-alongs or whatever. They didn't. But, um, and he'd make passes at them, you know, grabbing on their legs and... And doing and what's stuff. with the roommate? The roommate came forward and, and said Susan that said, he confessed to him. And in 1981, Funston's roommate. And they said that that wouldn't help. It wouldn't help. He went to the police, the local police, and said that Funston told him that he had done it. And he was already their suspect. The police have said, he is our suspect. They wanted him out of there. You know, he was fired because he... Funston was fired from the Raymore police because when he came across David's body, he called Kansas City Police Department, and he was supposed to have reported it to the Raymore chief, which actually doesn't make sense because he was found in Kansas City. Why would you call your, you know, whatever. But anyway, because of that technicality, they fired him. So do you think, obviously, he, he had to have known jurisdiction why he put him on the side of the street and make sure it was on the other side of the street. Yeah, he had he knew north and that county line. But who I, I don't buy his story that at three AM he's driving around looking for people making illegal dumps, which is what he claimed he was doing. He was driving down 155th looking for people. And then oh and he found a burning body, which we all know again, he loves fire. For his ex wife his ex wife. For his ex wife. His ex wife says, Do you think your husband could have done it? Well, he does like fire. Not no. Mm -hmm. Carbon dioxide poisoning. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. So that we were figuring or we're thinking that he was already passed out. He was already passed out by when the time. he was um doused with uh Gasoline or whatever the accelerant would have been. Right. So is he's is he being driven around nineteen fifty four car? So you know the exhaust system would have been bad. But driving around to scare him, driving around, and then he was assaulted or made him it was yeah assaulted, and then he helped pipe in the exhaust fumes also to maybe help kill him. Maybe. And then he probably thought. Maybe he is dead, or, you know, let's finish him there's, off. And right. There's so many, there's so many... Questions. Questions about that. But I would say, then possibly did think he was dead and then lit him on fire, or... Oh, they didn't even care. I don't, maybe I don't he didn't know. care. But it's... 
yeah, there's just, it's a three hour span there. I just can't imagine someone picking him up, just driving him around the whole time. I don't understand that part. On why the part? And, and then, why, yeah, his um, boots weren't on him. So his boots got taken off. Now, I don't know if his, pe- his boots were taken off to make it easier to tie him up. Or his, because he was fighting. Because he, yeah, kicking or at the trunk. He was or was he assaulted. was undressed. Yeah, because we, I don't know if the autopsy, how far they look into um, back then assaults. Especially on males. I, you know. And then he was, he maybe threatened him. The, the, David might have threatened him. And like, so he felt like, you know you what, can't I've do gone this too to far. Me. Right, right. And it, it, there's nothing worse than thinking that a police officer can use their power to intimidate people like that. These, you know, children, these juveniles, they, you need to be able to have these people to trust. He'd lost his father at 12 years old. He needed, you know, male role models. And this man is a pedophile, dirty cop, taking advantage of somebody like that. It just makes me sick. And then thinking that he was able to get away with this all his life. Because I honestly think they did know something about it. And I think that they would have just pushed him out instead of having to face it. And well, that's just it also makes me wonder if he knew someone, if um, uh, the office, Funston might have known someone in the Casey, Kansas City. I mean, they might have worked. Well, maybe because he, uh, Susan said that the first person he called, which he ended up calling KCPD, the first cop that showed up was someone, though, that had ties to... The get at the club. So our next episode, we are going to be looking in to the missing links. But so we are also thinking that maybe there could possibly, and this is just this is our theory. This is just ours that they may possibly be a slight tie into David's case. It's our theory on it, but we didn't want to include it completely in with David's episode. We wanted to because we completely believe that Funston is. Played a role, if not one hundred percent involved, but but we think there might possibly be a slight tie-in with them too. So we're going to do that next episode, along with another another case. Anyway, so um, David's birthday is December sixteenth, mm-hmm. and. I think it would be really, really great if we could somehow try to help get this solved. I am so sorry. <laughs> or like at least reopen, looked at. You know, reopen. I know, I know it's not closed case, obviously, but it just needs to be brought back up to the front. It really does. And I know there's people still around that know of this. You know, there are definitely, I would like, um, Funston's ex-wife, he's dead. He cannot hurt you anymore. If you have any information, get it off your chest. The roommate, that roommate, please come Mm -hmm. forward again. Other Um, officers? I mean, come on. Other officers. This is very hero. Right. We don't have very many of them left anymore, actually. No. Do it for David. So thank you for watching. Uh, yep, thank you. Please subscribe. And like we said, uh, please share because if you're not sharing, other people aren't watching and and we need help. They need help to um, solve these cases. Remember, any little clue could be the one thing that just tears it all open. And if you have any suggestions on cases that you want covered or if you want something covered on one of your loved ones, you can just message us. So, thanks for watching. Thanks.